Well, welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Lee and John Talk. We've uh, got to episode three. Another week has gone by. Um, we said this week we we're going to talk about courage and fear, about how you need to take action with even in fear. So we'll crack into that. Just say, has it been an interesting week for me of um, some highs and lows of there? Uh, we, we talked last week about how you do have these downs as well as the ups and I think a few things hit me mentally over the last week but I can still come through on a positive side it's just realizing there's a few more challenges than I was probably anticipating and I can see Lee's smiling at me because this is exactly what he told me was <laughs> was gonna happen so over to, to you Lee how's your how's your week been uh good morning or good afternoon John yeah my week's been interesting I think it's been uh a really ranging week of mostly of ups, so I'm happy to say there's been some real positivity and a couple of flashes out of the blue, but there's still some things that have happened. And so on a, on a, on a work front, it's been quite productive and I feel quite comfortable and I'm quite happy. On a personal level, it's been quite fun and good as well. So overall, a very good week. Thank you. OK, well, that's excellent. Um, please see it because you see we seem to have flipped roles. We're all the one with the biggest smile this week after after last week. So that's that's great to see. Um, in, in episode one, uh, when we first went for this, we said we would like to bring uh, guests on and we've uh, managed to, to, to pull someone forward who we thought would be good to add to this conversation of someone who's been through what Lee and myself are going through at the moment and come through on the other side. And as well as being a thoroughly uh, good bloke, um, uh, we've, we've invited our friend Nathan to, to, to join us this week. Um, don't laugh at him if he's wearing a black armband over Jurgen Klopp, but uh, I'm sure he'll, he'll get over that uh, soon enough. So, hi Nathan, how are you doing? Thanks for joining us. Yeah, I'm all good, thank you. I don't know how I feel being sat with a dirty gooner and a sad Spurs yeah. fan, but yeah, I'm, I'm still mourning the loss, even though he's still there. It's, it's, like, it's like when you know your missus is leaving, but you're sharing the same place and she hasn't yet gone out the door yet. <laughs> That's what I kind of feel like where Klopp's concerned. We know you're going, boss. We don't want you to go, but you are. And you're just hanging it out for us. But yeah, no, I'm all good, mate. It's good to see you both and uh, good to see you both looking so so well as well. Excellent. Well, it's, it's good to have you on. It's, uh, I've been really uh, enjoying your TikToks about what you've been up to. So do you want to just quickly share with everyone what you, you've kind of challenged yourself to over this year? Yeah, um, for some stupid reason i challenged myself to to run the london marathon so previously i've not really run any more than 10k um and that was back when i was in my prime 30s early 30s uh so now i'm taking on 47 years of age and i've decided to go and do 26.2 miles or just over 42k um yeah so it's been there's a, there's a lot of challenges actually in it which i didn't think i'd actually i, I knew it was going to be hard but I didn't know it was going to be as hard as it was. And this weekend's run was particularly challenging. It was a bad one, but it had to be a long run. Um, but, you know, there's certain things I've done around it all. Um, things like the journaling on TikTok. Every sing well, I try to do it every single day, but obviously there are time constraints. But just a two or three minute video about what I'm doing and sticking to the plan. Um, and then also having to have the flexibility to move the plan about when things don't quite go right. Um, but yeah, it's pretty good. I'm, I'm I'm desperately looking forward to it, but I'm also desperately nervous about it at the same time. And I've got to keep on telling myself certain things to keep myself in check. So when it, it comes to, obviously, we, we want to talk about courage and fear and things like that today. You know, what, what's, what's been going through your head of like, I know I, I want to get up one Sunday and run 20, 26 miles through the streets of London. I think, number one, it was an iconic thing to do. Um, I love my running, but I need a reason to get up and run. I need a reason to stay fit. Um, I think there's a, there's a lot of things that I've looked at, which even going back to I'm aging, you know, and I want to age nicely. And I don't want to get to sort of the stage where I don't go out and exercise and I don't feel fit and I don't feel like I've got energy and I've got and all those sorts of things. And that's massively important to me. I've seen how people have developed over the years. And, you know, I went to, I went to a funeral the other day. And I went down and saw some of my old school friends. Now, they all used to be skinny waifs, and I used to be the big lad. Yeah. And now I'm down there, and I'm the skinny waif, and they're the big lads. And it's, like, really funny because they go, what have you been doing? And I'm, like, running. Um, so I think looking at aging and how I, how I get older, and I don't want to sort of be not fit as I get older. So that's been one of the driving reasons behind it. Number two, it was an iconic race. Number three, it requires immense discipline, I think. Um, 
uh, and in motivation. And yeah, I mean, John, you've seen the TikTok of when I was minus four degrees with a wind chill of God knows what, and I'd actually frozen over. My beard had frozen over, my eyelids had frozen over, my my hair was white with ice. Um, and but it was but coming off the back of that, the way I felt when I got, I mean, mm. I was in Lidl defrosting. I was actually stood by the freezer defrosting in Lidl because the freezer was warmer than I was. Um, and this this woman was at checkout next to me. She just looked across at me. And she went, are you mad? And I went, no, I feel alive. And that's that's what you did. That's what the sort of things that come out of it. Mm. Um, but the flip side of it is that that distance. When I was out on Saturday, I had lots of negative thoughts going through my head on Saturday. Um, am I a bit of imposter syndrome? Can I do this? Um, what am I doing? Um, why am I doing it? Uh, my legs hurting, my knees hurting. It wasn't, it was all psychosomatic. Nothing was hurting. Um, oh, I'm out of breath. Oh God, am I doing the right things? Munch on another jelly baby. Have a little drink of your drink. Munch on another jelly baby. Oh, there's energy back there now. All these things, it's, you, you just go up and down these highs. Now, two hours, I'll take two hours running on your own in villages where you barely see anything except for a cow. Honestly, you've got so much time to think to yourself, but you've almost got too much time to think to yourself as well. I find it fascinating because I've done a lot of running and I think the things that are different from you and I, which I find really interesting is my uh, kind of like, I have a hunger and drive. Like, I don't ever take on liquid or eat when I run. I'm a weirdo, never, no matter the distance. I've done a half marathon. I've never done more than a half marathon. I could do that. My legs give out. But every step actually is a fight for me, I find running. It is an, and I love it for the, I love the thinking time. You can just actually, when it's a nice bit, it's downhill and you're not actually in absolute agony. I have a good old thing. But and then apart from that, I did find generally after a few steps, like, oh God, here we go. And it's like, and then it's a battle for me, always like fight myself. I just want to keep going out of sheer, I don't know, that's, that's, I think it's the same as you, this kind of, you can't stop me, I'm going to do this kind of thing. But and I, what I'm finding fascinating is like, since I've ever known you is you've always been a skinny man. And so that's interesting to see what you, in, what made you do it. Now, I've always had someone who has not been that big, but has struggled with my weight. And I've always done it to try and lose weight. So it's always like, come on, further you go, more you get out of it. Come on. And so it's weird to hear your complete different one of someone who, to, what motivates you. So I find that fascinating. Um, so what you're going to, uh, when afterwards, what's going to happen? Are you going to keep going or what will stop what, 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 what you do? Will you keep that, running? It sounds like you're not going to. Yeah, that's 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 the real difficult one, Lee, because, um, I mean, the interesting point that you make there as well is, I mean, I've, I've lost, like, from probably when I was mid-20s, I've lost about five and a half stone in weight um, as to what I was. Now, six foot three, six foot four, I'd always carry that weight quite well. But then there's the other side of it where it wasn't good on my joints and everything. Um, so now it's like a maintenance of weight, and it allows me to have a, a good nutritious diet around it. It's maintenance of weight. Going back to what you're saying about the, the precipice, you know, once I've reached that peak, once I've reached the precipice, what do I do next? I'm at the moment, I'm I'm aware that's there, but I keep on shoving it away because I just want to deal with this bit first, get to that precipice. When, I, when I'm still on top of what is my mountain, mm -hmm. I'll have a look out and I'll decide what do I do next. Now, there could be there could be there's other iconic marathons to run in the world you know um i could look at going and running a marathon overseas or something like that it may be that i just do another couple of domestic marathons and then once i've got myself in tune for that maybe i'll start moving into ultra distances and challenging myself that way um i don't know i'm a bit scared to look at that at the moment because i like i said i just want to get to the precipice and once i'm there look out and see what, what have i achieved and where can i go great so uh, it's, it's fascinating remembering that because you know um, me, me and Nathan, Nathan and I met back in 2012 um, when he was actually part of the interview process. Actually, he, he recruited me for a job, um, and I remember you know, what I noticed about Nathan is he, he was very good at you know he had his lunch with him every day. He's very clear on what he was eating, and you know I'm a big guy as we were getting to know each other kind of thing. And he just turned around to me and said, "Well, you know, I used to be like 20 stone." I mean, I was just looking at him going, you were <laughs> kind, of, kind of things. So I've completely forgotten about that, that story <laughs> from when I, when I met I think it, I think it's really funny as well, John, because sometimes people say to me about, you know, uh, don't tell me it's discipline. 
you know it's not discipline and blah 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 and i'm like well actually it really is but i think there's this whole mixture of things it's motivation it's discipline and blah blah blah. but i think a lot of it is discipline it's recognizing things when they come into your into your mindset and and trying to not not push them away or anything like that. acknowledge them i think that a lot of things that we don't do especially when we're looking at facing fear and and having the courage to face fear i think a lot of things that we don't do is we try to dispel whatever thoughts coming into the head rather than acknowledging it and understanding what's my process going to be to deal with it and that's so much of what we do is process you know it doesn't matter what you're in any any walk of life you know waking up each day there's a fear every day when i wake up you know am i good enough to do what i'm doing whether it be the running whether it be going to work whether it be all these things and it's always trying not to dispel that and just bat it out of your head you have to acknowledge that's there because otherwise you never deal with it and certainly going through the experiences I remember when I was out of work um, so many times those fears would come into my head and quite frankly I realized after a while you can't ignore them you have to acknowledge them you have to deal with them otherwise they will keep on coming back and you figure a coping mechanism for them or whatever it may be um, all of those things happen so that i think it's that's quite interesting when you start looking at it in that way i think it's be fascinating for our little chat here because i've just put down a load of stuff about you which i think doesn't make sense which i think is great which is like you've got an obviously amazing challenger mindset you challenge everything you'll challenge anything that comes up to you and, and you you're gonna any, any status quo you're gonna try and have test it to, your, to its most you're not an excuse maker, which I think is amazing. Clearly, there's no excuses. It's all about me and I'm doing it. And that's the way it's going to be. You're obviously competitive, which is great. Um, but then the, the other bits, you're, you're overanalyzed. I think, and I think that's going to be the key. All three of the people in this room overanalyze. We are all guilty of over -analytic, being overanalytical. But that then leads to the very bad things, which you are suffering from anxiety and lack of confidence. And see, someone like me who knows you love as well as John, I find this fascinating. So I don't, can't believe that. Um, and I think that's amazing that they don't match. I, I think they don't match. They're amazing how what the, the what the what the world sees of you and what you have inside you are two different things. And I find that fascinating with you because I, honestly, I wouldn't have said that anything. I when you say imposter syndrome, I go, "Wow, you!" I, I never thought that. I thought someone who's incredibly data driven, uh, very well presented, and always hard, worked hard, and, and and comes across really, really, really good, uh, and knows what he's doing. So if that helps. But I, I find that fascinating with you. I think it's really interesting to say that because you know what they say about most extroverts, hmm. that they're introverts hmm. and it's almost uh, the, the confidence and the bravado a little bit that comes out over the top is because they, they have to push themselves to be that sort of extrovert person. And I think I, I would, I love my own company. I love just being peaceful, quiet. I could go days without seeing people. Um, I love that sort of feeling. So I think when I'm in certain environments, for example, this today, when I'm in a work environment, when I'm out with friends, when I'm out, you know, having a, a social things, whatever it may be, I think that I, I then become the extrovert to a certain extent. I push myself to be something that I know that I, it's, it's, it's not sitting in the comfy chair, isn't it? You know, I don't want to sit in the comfy chair and I always want to push myself out of the boundaries all the time. So I, I think it's really interesting you say that because the perception it's different to the reality to a certain extent but as well you said about um the the like the excuse maker side of things i've when i've when i've lost jobs when i've had time to sit down and reflect i can always conclusively say yeah, there were certain things that were out of my control but there were a darn sight more that were in my control and i allowed the situation to control me as opposed to me controlling the situation and um i think again that does come back to you know, at first you go, oh, it wasn't my fault. It wasn't this. It wasn't that. I've, they, I've been done over. I've da da da. But then after a while, you play it back in your head and you go, hang on a minute. This isn't all them. This is on me. And again, I think it's part of that seeing something come into your mindset. And instead of disparaging it and just getting rid of it and saying, wasn't me, you've got to own it. You've got to own what whatever's going on or whatever happens. And that's that's the thing. Like, again, if I come back to like marathoning and training for the marathon. Um, I'm doing everything I possibly can to avoid injuries, to, um, which is probably the paramount thing, you know? I'm taking myself out of situations sometimes to avoid injuries. 
I've got a, a thorough training plan. It's not just all based around running. It's based around strengthening, stretching, conditioning. It's, it, you know, I, if something happens, which is completely out of my control, will I be annoyed? Yes. Will I be frustrated? Yes. Will I cry? Yes. But will I also go, it was out of my control. It was out of my circle of influence. There's nothing I can do about it. Whereas if let's say I pulled a hammy two weeks before, and I couldn't end up running the marathon. If I hadn't been doing the plan to the T that I'm following, that's my that's on me. And I think that's that's one thing that I've certainly learned from this experience. Yeah, I've taken a lot from what you've just said because you've also you've almost just described the last week for me in in where I am. Um, if you if you watch last week's uh, show, you you will see you know Lee was telling me he went yeah, but you know it's gonna it's gonna hit you eventually. And yeah, I started the week off on Monday and I wasn't feeling great, had a bit of a cold. And then Tuesday was just like, bam. And the whole thing just suddenly hit me. But what, what's interesting in what Nathan, you were saying there is about control the controllables. And I think that's exactly what happened to me last week of, yeah, there, there had been a, probably a bit of a denial from me on what was my fault into to where I am and what wasn't. But there is also circumstances that isn't my fault. And I, it was, I started looking, going, right, well, you know, what is it you're trying to do? You know, I, I wrote myself a note um, to read myself in the mornings now where it just says, are you serious? And it's like, and then I've written three things of, am I serious about these each days or am I just saying it on there? And it's, it's, it's getting the focus of don't just talk about it, start doing it. Um, you know, go back a few weeks, Nathan. I remember I messaged you saying, "Yeah, I'm going to do couch to 5k." And the next day, you're like, "Have you done it?" And it's like, "No, of course I haven't." You know, I've barely got to to walk in yet. But it's like, am I serious? Don't just say it. It's if I'm going to do it, commit and do it, which is what you're saying. Now, the the other thing is jumping back to something you said earlier. You started talking about process and consistency, and that's that's definitely a thing of what in the last week. And, you know, obviously you both got a message on me <laughs> during the week to say, you know, I'm a bit, having a bit of a bad week on here. But I also started going, but I've had this idea to do this and this. And that was me kind of believing in the, I don't want to say trust the process because I start saying like my Arteta Lee, but, you know, it's, I believe in the process I've got is right. I just had the inputs wrong. And as tough as last week was for me, I think it's pushed me to a place to, to go up a gear in what I needed to do and reset a little bit and refocus. And, you know, you talk about imposter syndrome. Yeah, I've definitely had that in the last week as well. But what I think this has allowed me to do and where I am is I could have quite easily looked back and gone, all oh, right, so the last six weeks have been a complete waste of time for me. But but they haven't. And it's not letting that voice take mm -hmm. over in my head. Because I can look back and go, yeah, but look what you have done in the last six weeks of skill sets that you've learned. You've you've understood things that you didn't know six weeks ago of how you can do that forward. And the the important thing here is, you know, it's having the discipline to take action, even if you don't want to, or even if you're nervous, you know, doing doing videos for the first time. All right, we're putting ourselves out there. You know, and there's been a couple of people that I haven't spoken to in probably 15 years have sent me comments or I've seen those signed up for something kind of thing. And they're like, oh, wow. So people are watching. People are, are taking notice. And it's, you know, it, having the courage to realize, to go, yeah, this is going to be uncomfortable. But if you're putting yourself out there, you're giving people a free passport to judge. And I'm relatively okay with that. You know, I've always been a pretty open book character. If anything, I talk too much and say share too much at times. But I do that particularly when I'm not feeling courageous or I've I've got fear about doing something. But I think what I've always been good at is when I am faced with fear, I get to brilliant. We're about to learn something, and I can turn that fear into excitement. So I'm okay with being uncomfortable. I like the challenge of pushing myself. And it kind of fits a little bit probably to what Nathan was saying about why do you do the running is somewhere in there, you know, it's pushing you to, to a level and getting out your head so much. I think the levels thing is really interesting as well. And, and I think accountability, you know, I think, I think you're, 
there's no harder taskmaster than me on myself. Okay. But being accountable to, you know, let's, let's say it sounds like a random thing, but it's part of the reason why I started journaling uh, on TikTok. I actually found a good side of social media in that I created a brand new account on TikTok, um, went down through, found loads of people to do with running, to do with motivation, to do with that, started following all those people. Um, and then obviously I was putting my stuff up as well. And some people have followed me back and I, and all of a sudden I get these really, you know, I get these, these comments just randomly from, from bits and pieces. It could be about, I've, I've mentioned about a book I've read or I've commented on somebody else's post that's in that sort of community about something I saw in the book and they, they've asked for a little bit more. So I've done a quick video on that. You start becoming accountable to everybody as well as yourselves. And I think it's like, you know, when I know John and, and you and I have had, or I've had tough times and you've had tough times, uh, by, by letting somebody know that I'm in that situation, I then become accountable to you to a certain extent because I know that you'll give me a kick up the backside and, you know, and stop those ill feelings necessary from coming in, which, which we all do. We also, we're only humans, you know, we're always going to find those things. And I think like you said last week to do with, um, you know, you found, you found something there. You didn't just allow yourself to just bury your head. You, you found something in there that you went, right. Yeah. Okay. You know, you started getting acknowledgement from people that, you haven't spoken to for years you didn't you didn't know before but now there's a slight accountability on you because they're going to want more you know they're, they're, they're joining in for a reason so now you've got a bit of accountability there as well i think that's an interesting thing that slowly builds through a lot of all these things yeah and i just think the, the key thing is um keep going keep taking action you know you you, you have days where you really don't feel like you want to you know uh, uh, Saturday morning, I went out for a drive because I just had to go and change the scenery because I was setting myself nuts. I could see my wife was getting annoyed with me because she could see I was obviously deep in process. And it was like, right, just go change the scenery, go do something different. And I did that for half an hour. And then that's when you probably both got messages off of me because it's like, I think I've got it. I've, I've got I've, I've got an idea and I'm letting you guys know because I'll forget by the time I drive home if I don't <laughs> say, say something about it. And it's been it's been really interesting because the moment I've kind of declared that, I was able to just open my, my Chromebook and almost just be sick on the page to go, wow, that will work commercially. Okay, there's a bit of work, more work to do on the marketing side and things like that. But it's like, I think I've got something here that, you know, that what I was trying to do over the last few weeks, I didn't probably really believe it in myself. It's, it's something I really was passionate about. But I, I knew there were some things missing from it. Whereas now, all of a sudden, I came home, did that. And then going back to the control what you control, I was like, right, I've applied for a load of jobs and I've not heard anything. So what's within my control? My CV, must, there must be a problem with my CV that I've been adamant my CV is fine. Right, go find a automatic tracker, scanner, whatever they're called, and put it in. And it came back 30 out of 100. It's like, so there is a problem with it. <laughs> And two hours later, I've sat there and I've got 100 out of 100 CV now. And then, right, LinkedIn. I was like, oh, Christ, I haven't even looked at my LinkedIn for ages. Right, so I've now gone through and done that. So as much as you can blame everyone else for on there, there is always the things that you can control yourself. And off of having that bit of the world pushing me, you know, trying to bring me down, it did highlight a couple of gaps that were completely within my control to go and do. And you know what? Fixing them didn't seem like any effort because I knew it was the right thing to do. Whereas before, you know, I've applied for say 10 jobs today. Last week I was barely struggling to do one a day because I was just wasn't in it. And it shows the difference in motivation. There's something in, in, in us when you get in that state that stops you taking action and it puts you into an avoidance mode mm. because it's like, well, if I don't do anything, I can't get, I can't get hurt. I can't, I can't damage myself. Whereas I think as tough, you know, last week was a tough week for me, but I didn't let it stop me. I still kept taking steps no matter how small. And, you know, you know I'm under no illusions. I've got a up and down path ahead of me <laughs> for sure, but I'm starting to, to come through the other side of where I am and probably the, the denial and anger parts are probably now behind me um, 
it's now probably yeah frustration to to acceptance and, and getting through it is probably where I am now. Yeah, I think it's really funny and interesting what you said. So you two were speaking there and before you said a word just then in the last bit you were spoken about, I've written down a long time ago, which is motivation. It, we, you two were circling it massively and talking about, you wouldn't say the word until you just said it just now, but you're both talking about different motivation and how it makes you work in any way. And I think it's very really important that you find yours or match it to something in other words, enough to be successful, to be something. Otherwise, if you're not motivated, it's just not going to work. And I can speak from personal experience. I know that motivation has been lacking maybe in certain jobs and it's never worked out well for me when the motivation lacks because there's no love, there's no passion, there's no drive, no determination. And, and for me, I'm all about that. If I, if I can't have any of that, then it, there's, you're not going to get the full me. It's kind of like... um. With footballers, you know, end of the day, top footballers are all incredibly good. It's only about one or two percent that separates the, the the very top players from the kind of mid-table players. So I find that fascinating how that you can adopt that. Um, I was going to ask him a question, but he's walked away. But because I was really interested with regards to with motivation, how we can use it in different things. Because so John had a tried to do a couch to five k and struggled immensely, just basically couldn't do it. But then he just told us a story about how he managed to obviously not getting any jobs and not getting recognized from these jobs he's going for but he managed to turn that around and actually find the fact that he actually can motivate himself to that but still the weird thing is that he can't motivate himself to the couch to 5k so i want to ask him about that in two seconds but i also say there's always this um negative voice and i do pull back to this what i said before about the certain individuals that i think the three of us are in particular which is those who well arguably too self-critical too quick to think oh, i'm this and that because I say, um, I, I, I'm just saying, my sister is always a perfect example. She has been, sadly, you know, numerous jobs not worked out for her and things like that. I can tell you that every single one, there's a reason why. And it's never her. I can promise you every single time, isn't it? And, and I'm like, and I sit there and I try and tell her how, how she's so wrong and that she needs to learn and she needs to look at herself and she needs to know that you can't be like that. And then I'm like, but what do I know? What do, what do I, I she's happy she's blissfully unaware of her ignorance you know she's so who's right why am I right because I sit there tearing my soul apart saying how uh, this and that you know what I mean it's it, for me yeah, yeah it doesn't make sense but I did want to ask the question I just said if you heard that John I was going to come back to you because I've got a couple of things otherwise I want to talk about that but in a minute but I find it fascinating the motivation point we just we, we were talking about that before you jumped off uh, but with you get yourself you were talking about motivation how you lost it you found that you you basically put your head back in the machine off you went but the couch to 5k one you can't do and and i find that one fascinating why can you do the other ones but you can't motivate yourself to do that one what's the difference in motivation why does it work like that all right well i think on that one we're, we're obviously talking uh 35 years worth of issues of why i'm an overweight guy um i i accept things when it comes to my weight of the, the way i am that it's my choice that i am um it, it links to a lot of emotional eating stuff where an abandonment basically <laughs> and for me if i'm happy i eat if i'm unhappy i eat but what i do know is food is always there for me and that's a huge thing in my head the, the reason about the couch to 5k is i just not a fan of exercise and i probably would be if i start um i have got in the habit where i have been going for a walk every day which is a huge thing for me um and it's been quite good because me and sarah have been going together and even if we're just going around the block a couple of times at least we're making the effort and maybe the running will come still a little bit too cold for me um you know as nathan referenced the video uh, <laughs> he did post uh i think it was between christmas and new year where he was literally frozen um, you see joke things in films or he actually was like that with christmas bits on there um do I want to lose weight? Yes, I do. I think for me, and it links back to a little bit of what Nathan was saying, is about being healthy as you get older. Um, mm -hmm. I think for me, it's a, it comes to maybe to energy of having that energy to get through the day. And me being me, there's the too many uncertainties at the moment. And I, I'm going to challenge, I'm challenging myself even as I'm saying it, because I know this is going to be a load of nonsense, but you know I've always worked hard when I'm in a job and I my day can revolve around being in where I need to be and I haven't got that at the moment 
But as I say, I've realised I've got free choice to spend my day however I want <laughs> at the moment. So <laughs> not going for a run isn't even labour excuse um, on there. So um, the the motivation isn't there because I don't really want it. Is the honest answer. Um, there's things that I do really want, and it comes down to to being in a settled life of allowing you to do things that you love doing and running for me isn't in my love doing and no, well, like that's, that's, that's for me was what i wrote down this spot on this is it for me you don't have to run running is not the be all end all answer you can there's a you have to find in because otherwise you if you did start running and you went and you weren't enjoying it well guess what even if you made yourself do it for two weeks you ain't gonna do it you've got to find what you like doing Again, motivation, match it. You can't make, if you can't make it in that bit, well, find the bit that you can find in the exercise you like doing. Yeah. I used to I used to run a lot. And only recently I've stopped because I'm screwed. I'm done. I'm done running, done, because I've injured myself really badly. And it's I, I, I'm, I'm worried I'm never going to be able to walk properly again. It's dramatic, but I really think so. My knee is a mess. So I'm not running anymore. I've switched it. I'm now doing other stuff in the gym. I'm doing the epilator. I'm doing rowing machine. I'm doing the skier. I'm doing the uh, walk. I walk, walking and weights. I love that. So the thing is, is, there's other things, and I love all of those different other things, and they're going to help me out even more. And I find that, and I, because I, I always revert back to running, because my personality weirdo likes the pain. Masochist loves it. Loves the sweat. Loves the pain. Love like the satisfaction you get. But also, really importantly, and this is where I would say with you it's important, forget the health benefits, mental health and exercise, I have to. If I don't exercise, I can tell you right now, within a couple of weeks, I start my, my mind's gone off because I need the endorphins. I need the energy, what I get from it. So forget the health of what I look like. It's really, it really channels me really, really well. I think it's interesting, Ben, because, I mean, certainly, I, I probably, I didn't actually highlight it, but I need to do that stuff as well. I need to get outside. I need the fresh air. I need that endorphins rush. I need the sweat. I need to feel like I've been out and challenged and pushed myself. Uh, coming back to the motivation, one thing that you reminded me when you said, Lee, about the motivation, um, I, I've had this setting, uh, this this saying that I've had for years, and, and John will probably remember it, which is that, you know, if you don't swing your legs out of bed in the morning, mm. then, then give up whatever you're doing, okay? Mm. Because really what's the point in trudging yourself into something that you you got no appetite for you know you don't need to do it so that's why i always found that when when i'm going back to blaming myself for potentially for circumstances job wise that have happened to me um i can actually say that at certain points i didn't want to swing my legs out of bed in the morning and i knew i was burnt i knew i was done um it was picked up on by one of our directors, he said, "What's the matter with you?" He said, "He said normally this would this would fire you up. This would this would make you frustrated. I'd, you'd be challenging me. You'd be." But I said, "You're not doing it." And I, at that time, I didn't notice this. I didn't recognize this. But I was like, "Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Just head's not there today. I'm not too sure why." And it, it was because I burnt. I'd gone. Now, I, I then a few days later, I was back up in swinging legs. But then the the down days were coming more regular. So I think I knew I was I was gone at that time. So I think, you know, when you're talking about, you've just said the same, you've said the right thing there. If you can't run, you don't have to run. You, you can go, you can do weights, you can do walking. God, if, if you're somebody that doesn't do much walking and you go out and just do a small amount of walking, fantastic. If that walking then becomes a larger amount of walking, brilliant. If it means that you do a few weights in the garage, brilliant. You know, who knows how it's all going to evolve, how these things are going to influence you and, and change you as you go forward. But I think you mentioned earlier on, Lee, that when you first sort of set foot out in maybe the first 100, 200 meters or, you know, half a kilometer or kilometer, that trying to get your breathing, you know, when your body's fighting against you and you feel like um, I, I'm, I haven't got any energy, my breathing's not right, I'm really unfit. That happens to me every single run without fail. And it, and, but I can deal with it now because I, I, I understood that that was breathing recalibration. I had no idea about this thing, but your body's basically going, all right, all right, out for a run, are we? Okay, Tonto, let me just get my breathing sorted out. And then you, you spend that first kilometer, maybe a mile, just recalibrating your breathing. And what the weird thing is, when you're then two miles into your run or three kilometers, wherever the distance measurements are, you forget about that at the start. You, it's, it's gone. 
because your, your body's recalibrated itself and you're just pushing and pushing and pushing and you're sweating and the endorphins and all those things, you know, it's all beginning to happen. It's all beginning to come together and the sun's coming up, you know, and it's a frosty morning and it's bright orange skies and bright red skies. You know, all those things start to happen. But again, it's a learning experience for me. I had no idea about these things. But all of a sudden, through doing a bit of research, understanding a little bit more, you know, and this is why when some people go for the couch to 5K, and I'm not saying it's John's situation, but couch to 5K, they get up off the couch, they go out and do their first things, and it's got maybe a walk, stroke, little run, you know, mm -hmm. and they do that little run, and they're immediately out of breath. Mm -hmm. And they go, oh, I'm so unfit, I'm never going to be able to do this. And they just close down immediately. And that's not the case. If I, if I knew what I know now about all of this, I would have carried on, you know, that I would keep on going. And, and that's, that's my biggest takeaway, I think, so far from this, is if somebody said to me, I could never do what you do, I would say, you don't have to do what I do, but you'll be amazed at what you can do if you just put yourself out there. But also, instead of just going and doing it and getting despondent, learning about every single thing that's happening on your journey. And I think that's that's one of the biggest things I've taken away from this. Yeah, and it, there's, there's a lot there because you, you referenced journaling as well earlier, which is something I know we both both do. And it is capturing those those nuggets, like you just said, of understanding, you know, you, you're at a level of running of, oh, you know, for me, it'd be, oh, crap, I, I've got out of breath. Whereas for you, it's like, no, that's just step one because there's another two steps after. And it's, you've journaled, you've, you've, you've acknowledged, you've learned, you've reflected, and that's now where, where you are. And it, it kind of comes into the courage of fear. And also talking about as, as, as leaders, because I've had this in the workplace where you can go in and come and tell me until the cows come home that, yeah, but here's level two and three. If my standard is level one, you're talking you know, what's the yeah. word, gibberish, goop, or, or, you know, whatever I'm trying to say. It's what, it, to, to me, it's like you're talking a different language. Yeah. Gibberish or gobbledygook, you just said they're both the yeah, same Yeah, we'll, we'll go with both of them. We'll, we'll get a bit of word salad in there. But it's it, it's interesting because, as I say, it's just from a, a leadership principle of what you're saying in there is it's if, when you're, you're communicating and you're trying to motivate other people with that is under, you, you've got to kind of go to their level and appreciate where they are and take them on a journey to get there so you know by nathan saying today if you go for a little run and you do get out of breath don't worry that's that's what it's there to do that's part of the process whereas to me you're exactly right i would have gone so unfair i can't do this so maybe i will go for a little run we'll see but at least i know now is all right i'm gonna hit that pretty early and as long as today's one is to just kind of get through that, I can then sit and have a look at it afterwards and see what I take from it. I think as well, you know, if I go back to some advice that I imparted on one of my friends years ago, um, and he was he was he was going for a new job. He was extremely fearful about going for it because he suffers with sort of mild dyslexia and it was going to be a lot of report writing and all these things. And, and he had a terrific amount of fear about going for it. Now, it's, we always say it's easier to find a new job when you're in a job. You know, that's, that's, that's obvious. Um, he was in that comfy position where he was going for a promotion, but he had all these doubts and elements in his head. Um, so I just had a couple of chats with him. But one of the biggest things I said to him, I said, is, look, I said, what you're basically describing to me is that you're quite content where you are and you're quite happy where you are and you you're you're nervous and you you haven't got the courage to take that next step because your your brain's telling you what you can't do why don't you start looking at what you can do in that job and understanding that everything else will come with it you know we're we're designed to learn from our mistakes okay if you're up front with whoever you're going for a job with and you say look this is what I'm going to bring you, okay? However, I'll be up front with you. I'm not great at doing this bit, okay? But I will get there. I'll work and I'll do that. I'll, I'll, I'll get that side of the job for you. That can sometimes play quite well. But mm. we're, de we're designed to learn from mistakes all the time, okay? The person that never makes mistakes is the person that's, that's going to live in their fear 
and I and you know that could be controversial to a lot of people for me to say that but I really do think that's the case and if you look at everything from Formula One to aircraft to all these sorts of different things you know you look at the when Senna you know died it in in Formula One the lessons that that sport took from just that one incident and over the years is it is now why we're in a fortunate position that when they Formula One cars go racing, a tragic accident doesn't occur as much in, you know, as it used to, because there's so many lessons they always learn. And you apply that principle to yourself in life. Look at aircraft, how safer, how much safer aircraft are now than when they were 30 years ago, 40 years ago, because they never let something happen. And it's not necessarily a mistake, you know, an, an error or something unfortunate happened without taking learnings from it. And I think as we need to apply that to ourselves as well from everything we do. You know, you get a learning and you apply it to yourself and you move forward and you take the next step. You know, that that my mate now, he went into that job. He got that job. He did use the phrase, I'm, I'm not going to sit in the comfy chair. I'm going to push myself. I want to extend my boundaries. I want to be better. I want to grow. I want to take that next step. He used all that lingo. He got the job. He's gone in there. And, you know, he's doing a fantastic job from what he tells me. I mean, we all tell each other we're doing a fantastic job. But, you know, maybe his bosses will say something different. But but he's never, he's he's constantly, you know, come back to me and said, thank you for pushing me. Thank you for opening my mind up. Thank you for this. And I'm like, no, you did it. I just gave you a little bit of wisdom on the way. That's yeah. all. And it's, it's interesting, you know, the, the three of us and you know we've all worked with each other in different ways but we are all more on the risk taking side to a degree probably me and me a bit further the other way than you nathan but even still you're still you're, you're a bit more what was your phrase an educated risk taker i think is you like yeah. you get to a point of comfort of knowing something before you do it but the reason I believe we've always worked well together is because we've got that mentality of we've got to get to take an action. We don't sit and like spin our heels or you know, twiddle our thumbs. Is, and, and it comes from is we're not afraid to fail. I think we've all learned that in our career is the reason we got to the levels we got to is because we made mistakes. You know, I, I can look back to earlier in my career, but to say when I became a people manager, you know, I became a people manager relatively early in my career and just learning, you know, managing people on what time to get the office. Don't bother with it, you know, um, but when you start managing, you do, oh, you're a minute late. It's like, who cares? You know, now it's like, just get to work on time. You're an adult <laughs> kind of thing. But you, you, you learn that all you do is aggravate and annoy people when you start managing in that way so that's a learning for early in my career of trying to be a rule stickler too much whereas now i'm probably too far the other way so i just assume people are an adults and you understand you're paid to do a job that and you've signed a contract that tells you what time you're supposed to be there I, i'll treat you like an adult in that in that respect because i really can't be bothered to have those type of conversations with <laughs> with people <laughs> so it's 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 interesting um you're saying is it is taking that risk and understand you're going to learn from it and again apply it to myself over the last 60 odd days where i've been creating videos i've been doing things like that and behind in my head is it wasn't just about the content i was putting out there it's the process of what you need to do to put a video out there and how long does it take what do you need to do you know I've, I've learned all things about, say, retention marketing now from a, in, in engagement, which I didn't know anything about. Um, I've learned how to do things on pieces of software that I didn't know existed. Um, you mentioned AI. You know, AI is the biggest thing that's going to come in and change over the next seven years in business impacting already. And this initial phase of AI isn't about robots replacing humans. It's about how do you work in a hybrid way of how humans and robots start working together. And you can already see there's big misconceptions out in the workplace of going raging from fear of, oh, we're being replaced by robots to, oh, the robots will do everything for us. We don't need the humans. Both are mistakes that people are going to learn coming up. And we now have to survive in a world and make those changes to go, where do I come from and it's all going to come down to personal branding of who you are as an individual what is the skills that you offer that are very specific and how well can you 
create a contact uh, content that gives you a personal branding because that's what's going to make you stand out going forward and, and you look at how people consume information and what it does employees are going to change the nature of what they're going to do not so much just because they're a body they're doing the work it's what does that particular person offer in there and i think we're going to see a massive change in the workplace and we've seen a lot over the last few years since covid but there's a huge change coming up with this and there's lots of different thoughts on it at the moment and it's going to be scary for people but it will also be one of the biggest opportunities people have got in our lifetime. And that's hard for us as you know, generation Xs who have always understood the cavalry ain't coming and you've got to change and do it right through. You, you saw a post in the TikTok earlier this week about um, a generation Z said people are bringing their parents to, to interviews with them. And I was sitting there going like, what, what the hell? <laughs> I wouldn't even think of bringing my mum to an interview. <laughs> <laughs> kind of thing. So it's, it's it's just really interesting that you know failure is going to be a key skill for people because you've got to get the real experience. You can't pick up a textbook and read about it. You've got to do it and demonstrate that you've understood it. And the learning employee is the one that's going to become valuable. I think it's um listen, we've got a lot of change coming up. Change is the key word, but I think everyone should be excited by change to some degree. I think in some respects I'm not very good with change, but this kind of change is kind of, it's the future that's coming. And for me, actually, the way I, I'm looking at AI, and I think it's the gold rush, it's the new gold rush. It's gonna be okay, yeah. Look, I, AI is a lot older than we know of it. The, 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 I know you two both know it's been around about 10 years, but you know, the in the large scale of things, it's gonna be adopted massively in the next five years. So I think it's a really interesting space to watch. What I thought was really interesting listening to you both was um, the way you're talking about how people can do things and how you approach certain situations, both of you. And it's funny because as much as, much as we're all so similar, we, we approach things in a very different way, which I find fascinating. Uh, Nathan, the one word for Nathan is pragmatic. He's incredibly pragmatic. He loves to learn, loves to, you know, really. Uh, John, the, the word is logic. Uh, John's word is logic. It's very logical, applies very logical thinking to things. If I do this, that outcome should be this and that. And and, and then you have me. And uh, I think I'm slightly different. I don't think, I think it's one word. I don't know. It might be two words. The word that comes to mind for me um, is bulldozer. Uh, it's what I am. I, I kind of, um, yeah, I, I'm very loud and I'm very brash. And and, and I, I, I think I try to employ pragmatism and uh, logic, but sometimes I think I just battle through. But I think it's uh, really interesting to see how we all approach it. So the point for me is that everyone can approach it in a different way and get the results they're looking for to get. Because I think I'm I'm no gambler. I can tell you that for nothing. I, I am no gambler. I hate gambling. Why? Because I hate losing. And it's a hate to lose in everything I do, which is really interesting. And it obviously is probably why I'm partly a salesperson, because it I hate losing, so it makes me go back again. But the, I am ambitious. I, I And I know I've got to try. I've got to push. I've got to give it all. I've got to succeed. So those are my drivers. You know, these are the, the behind the bulldozer is a very is someone who thinks a lot, tries to apply logic, tries to be pragmatic, but also does does uh, bash down everyone who gets in my way as well. Yeah, I think I think that comes down to the evolution of characters as well, though, because I you know remember I started out as a sales and marketing assistant and became an analyst who became a sales manager, which is a very bizarre yeah. path. To, to have gone in a career, but it is because I was able to use logic to make decisions and take action. If you go to me early in my career, is I couldn't make a decision. I think I was very indecisive and and I had to, to learn and grow from that. And you know, the, the logical side of me has a big downside is that I can massively overthink at times and get myself stressed out. And, well, not stressed out, drain my energy because I'm trying to think of worst case scenario, the best case scenario. And yes, it's a skill for me and it's something I can do relatively quickly, but at a cost. What I do also know is the thing I've always got running in the background with that is make a decision, get started. And, you know, when's the best time to have done something yesterday? When's a great time to have done something today? And when's a good time to do it? Tomorrow. But do it just get started because I, I saw a wonderful quote. Um, don't turn around in six months time saying, I wish I'd done that six months ago. I'm not sure if one of you sent me that or someone else, but um, it, it, it's a very apt phrase of the learning and development of all our characters. 
it doesn't, you know, I, there's times, you know, I've taken from you, Lee, of be a bulldozer. And I've learned that from you, from you, Nathan. I've learned that pragmatic side at times of possibly I'll summarize it another way of saying measure twice, cut once. Whereas I can be a little bit right, right, swing the sword, let's get going. You're, you, you've been very good with me and understand me. Okay. Just, just if you do that, have you thought about this? I mean, like, mm, yeah, I hadn't. <laughs> but I think in reverse, I've offered that to you of sometimes you don't need to measure twice, you just need to get on with it. So. I think uh, as well, you know, like to, a question to yourself, Lee. I mean, I know you've been slightly longer, you know, in this process than John has. A question that comes from me is you, you're a bulldozer, okay? But you've had a, probably an awful lot of time to reflect, okay, on on the past goings on, on all those sorts of things. Has any of that reflection given you the courage now to to do something different or think differently or approach things differently, you know? what's you know has it dealt with any potential fears that you've got or anything like that no i think i think you're right and in regards to obviously looking back and, and trying to assess where i was and what happened and where you go from there and stuff things like that i think i've analyzed the death out of it and, and every so often obviously things creep into my mind constantly as you can appreciate feelings of upset feelings of of being done over feelings of not knowing who to trust, feelings of obviously most importantly that are completely of blame, self-blame. Mostly I'd say 80% is looking at myself. So I think what I try and do that is where I would employ the pragmatism is I'm like, it's what I would say, I try to coach myself as I coach someone else, which is an example. When someone's on a phone call, uh, when I'm trying to coach them uh, when they're doing pitching and stuff, my rule would always be try and keep it limited to a few things, three things maybe on that call, you start going about 10, 15 things, what are you trying to achieve? There's never, no one's going to be able to make wholesale huge changes to how they do something. So I believe in incremental small changes. So right, I included that myself. What can I take out of my last experience that will make me grow? And there's about three things I've got from it. Like I just want to try and nail them and learn from it and actually apply them. There is things that are crept over from previous times, but this time it's like, right, I have the three. If I do these, I should succeed. But the biggest thing for me, I know, is my motivation. I think what you said about the swinging legs, I completely related to because I knew I was in a bad place when I knew, what, I, frank and honest, that I was all about the money and it was all it was. It was completely about the money. It was about nothing else. I was earning more money than I could have dreamed of. And I was not good. And I didn't, I didn't care what, I wasn't happy and I didn't like necessarily the culture or the company. I was like, I couldn't care less. I'm earning loads of money. It's amazing. And, um, yeah, and 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 as we've discussed before that we started, I, I could see things creeping up, and I knew things were happening, and I just ignored them because I was like, "Well, I need the money, and I love the money, and I want the money. I'll take the pain. I'll take feeling absolutely terrible. It's fine. Money makes you feel better." Uh, the answer is obviously it, it it made a lot of things feel better. It was great for some respect, but it also I can't have a year like I had last year, which was a year of of a potential on paper the best on paper would have been the best year of my life but it wasn't but behind the scenes there was chaos and upset and and pulling oneself apart not worth it would i do it again that's okay the biggest lesson there you go made me pull it out yeah i think i couldn't do that again i can't do that again don't ignore the signs do something about it uh there's always that famous scene I, I recite to people and it's what i used to say about what was going on in my last company i love an analogy as uh John knows and, and Nathan, you probably know as well. But so it was the best analogy ever I've ever seen the film, which was the scene in Austin Powers when the guard is standing there screaming at a steamroller saying, no, no. And it's rolling towards him at an incredibly slow speed. So obviously the answer is he could have done anything, but he sat there screaming no until it squashes him. And that's how I felt. I could see it coming. I just stood there just going, I'm just going to stand and watch it. It's coming to me so slowly, but I, I'm just going to stand and watch it. And, and I think that is, uh, yeah, take action. Yeah. Uh, don't, don't get... we, we've all been there, I think, Lee. With I, I think I hadn't thought of that analogy, but I think I can certainly relate to that in uh, a couple of times. And it's definitely a be prepared to show some courage because you're going to accept your game's about to finish in in what yeah. you're doing and. Possibly I've recognised that too quickly at times in, in the past. And obviously we're not by choice, but we are career jumpers um, where we jump roll and that's how we've elevated ourselves. And that's that's the route. We're not people that have 
had the fortune or misfortune, whichever way of looking at it, of, of being that person who stays in one place. But certainly for me, that's where my growth came from. You know, I worked for a company for seven years thinking I'd be there my whole life. And one day that ended. And on that journey after that, I started meeting people like yourselves. And, you know, there's lots of other mutual people that we know that we could add into that. We've met some great people at work that have made us better at what we do. And even to just talking about money then, you know, I think we've all been through that of, oh, wow, you know, you know getting a promotion at work. It's like they're paying me how much? You know, I, I know me and Nathan have had conversations before where we've just kind of come out of these meetings and looked at each other and went, really? Why, why have they done that? And it's because we've worked our ass off and done a good job. I don't think they value, value us. But the, the money motivation does change. And maybe it's a maturity thing as you get older, you know, as, as life and demands change and you start realising, yeah, don't get me wrong, it's nice getting those big paychecks, but you start appreciating the at what cost, though, because it, it is a time for money thing of how you generate the money through a, a career. It's down to probably how much effort you've put in, and that's a lot a lot of effort. So it's great saying I've got all these big salaries and I've done all of this. There's certainly expectations that comes with it and how much your life will get taken over by it. And I've been fortunate in my life um, when my wife was happy to stand by me, which meant, you know, I could randomly quit a job and then fly to Australia 48 hours later for two weeks and miss Valentine's Day. <laughs> hey, I got to go to Australia. You know, the entire times me and Nathan, we, we obviously got to go to Boston a couple of times at a company, which was great. And we both had supportive partners, partners that let us crack on and go and, and do that. Um, it, it certainly, I think the money is a motivator thing changes, you know, early in your career, having all that money is great. But I can look back, if I know what I knew now at 21, I would have done things very differently and I could probably retire at this point if I know what what I know now. But you won't you won't ever know that at that age. <laughs> I think as well, it's really oh, I was gonna say uh, sorry, I was gonna say Lee, but I think what's really interesting is listening to both of you there. Um I was only only on Friday night, I was chatting to a friend and they are absolutely right in the sweet spot of it of everything you've just said. They are they're on a decent salary, they're, they're a decent wage. They're burning every single day. Um, they've, to use uh, John's phrase, they uh, they talk gibbery gook um, when it gets to 5.30 of an evening or seven o'clock or whatever time they finish. Um, I love that, gibbery gook. It's gonna, yeah. we're, gonna have to, we're gonna have to like hashtag or something. Um, <laughs> As, as created by John Daniels, but they, but you know, they, they're in that phase now where they're, where they're, where they're burning, but they're earning a really decent salary wage and they can't see the wood for the trees and, and they, but they're acknowledging the impact it's having outside of the workplace as well. Um, that impact is having on their own health. They're trying to take steps to do, to, to remedy that outside of their personal life, but they can't do that because they're just so tired every day and when it gets to the weekend. So it's so interesting hearing both of your scenarios that you found yourself there, that, you know, if it's anything that I can give you two guys comfort for, is that you two ain't the only ones that are there, you know, or have been there. It isn't, and anybody that may be watching this, you know, you, you're not alone. This happens time and time and time again. It's not an unusual situation. The difference is to bring it back to the two words, take action. What action are you going to take to get yourself out of that? How are you going to control the situation rather than letting the situation control you? It comes back to the same thing time and time again, like a stuck record. But I think that's always what I figure. I think it's great. I think to, to, to actually answer your question, how do I go about it? What have I done? I've entered it and it's funny, obviously I've done, I've tried to apply pragmatism and logic to my search, but I've been a bulldozer. Let's be frankly honest and clear. I have applied to a hell of a lot of jobs and that is what I've done and tried to go for that no, tried to go for that pain. The masochist has is, is done his best to try and th find things to make himself upset and hurt himself as well. So I have been reject embracing rejection and dancing with it on a regular basis recently, but it's been a really interesting journey because I think what is interesting is that I've, I've been 
for jobs that I knew I had no chance for. I've been for jobs that I felt I had a chance for. And I've been for jobs that I'm sure was a shoe in for and been rejected from all three at different times and obviously accepted other ones. And I find that bizarre. I think it's absolutely crazy. So why I try to employ logic and pragmatism, I'm like, there is no logic. When there's something in, when a competitor to my previous company had a role and they wouldn't even see me, I'm like, oh my God. Uh, I don't care what it says on my CV. It says I'm the ex head of sales of your competitor. And you won't even see me? Jesus Christ. That, that was a dark day. I'm going to be completely honest with you there. But hey, so the, the one thing I wanted to say was, because um, we've also talked about this, but when is, when is ignorance bliss? When is it good to be ignorant? And when is comfortable okay? Because my other thing, I always say this, and I, and I always think it's great to push yourself and everything like that. There's also, but that's, I think you're talking to two other personalities here who have that in them, that innate ambition. Pay, but that then therefore makes us arguably unhappy at times. I, 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 gosh, there's got, goodness, if, if everyone was as ambitious and had this drive that we do, who would do things that we, I'm not even going to say horrible things about other jobs, but menial tasks that we may think are beneath us, who would do those jobs? The answer is no one, because it would be fine, you know, we'd be in, so surely there has to be some level of comfortableness that has to be, which, do, when do you know, when is your limit, when do you know, how do you know your limit? How do you know I'm where I should be in the workplace? I'm in a good place. I'm earning okay money. What's okay? Okay, it's always good. It's me, right? What you? What is the well, I, I think uh, there's a there's a few answers to that. But it's, it's it's when you wake up in the morning, what are you worried about? And if you're waking up in the morning and you're worrying about money, then that's that's the problem. Because when you're not worried about money, you don't tend to to have any thought about it as well. And you know, I've, I'm someone where I've earned a lot of money. I've earned less money. I've been through it all. After a while, as long as it's paying the bills, you don't really take too much notice of it. It's the moment, and maybe this is a bit of a Maslow's hierarchy of needs thing here. It's when it impacts your well-being, that's when it's a problem. If if you can get up and go and do a good job every day and know, right, I'm, I'm going to do nine to five, I'm going to come home, I'll work harder than there, but I'm not going to apply much thought to it. Hey, cool. As long as you're happy with it and you're rewarded, but it's not leaving you in a position where you're struggling. And I think that that's, you know, as three people that are workplace career people, um, we've learned those lessons in there. But all three of us started at the bottom. We all started where we weren't earning that much money. You know, my first job many, many years ago, I was earning £11,000 a year. And... I can, oh, if we lost uh, Nathan, I think. <laughs> but, uh, you know, in my first job, that's how my. Hello, we back? <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. Okay. Um, well, let's uh, say Ace, at that time, I had a great year because that was £11,000 more than I was earning the previous year. Yeah, that's great. And I cut my cloth accordingly. And as you go up, you cut your cloth accordingly now as someone who's a notorious bootstrapper who doesn't like spending money i've always had a quite tight control over budgeting you know my dad scared the crap out of me when i was younger if you can only spend money spend what you've got and you only use credit cards in emergency i've i've relatively you know my pain and suffering has been i've gone without rather than put myself in trouble and i don't get me wrong i'm saying that's the right thing to do because i also know i've probably cost myself at times by not investing in something or trying to do something on the cheap and then having to pay twice for it. Oh, there we go. Is he back? I'm, I'm coming back. I'm going to let me get the right screen on. <laughs> um, but you, you, know, you, you see what I mean? It's, it, yeah, I do. It, I find it fascinating. It, it cut, it's, it's cutting your cough accordingly. I get you, but I think it's going to defend the first thing. Because again, I feel like I'm the, um, uh, the, 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 the thorn in the side today. Um, I agree. Cut yourself a cloth accordingly. I was brought up slightly different from you in a place where very extravagant parents overspent ended up in a big mess like huge mess you know you're talking uh a house um taken away and stuff like that repossessed it was horrible right so i've been in that kind of scale having everything they had everything they lost everything and it, all the embarrassment that comes with that and um and I, and I think that's a huge driver for me, but I, I, I've never, I have spent what I haven't, but also when you said credit cards, by the way, I have a very strong feeling about credit cards. 
I believe they should be used on a regular basis, but only and repaid in full at the end of the month. Absolutely. They are not to be used as anything else than a point collector. I think anyone who doesn't use have a credit card is crazy, by the way, because you shouldn't, what you get if you don't have a debit card spending nothing, but you have to pay it in full every month. But I mean, that, that, took- that, that's a good example of where I've learned, though, because uh, before it was like you would only use an emergency, whereas now it's I put everything on the credit card, but it gets paid. On payday, yeah. it gets paid off, and there isn't a, a balance on it, and that's what I mean of learning. It's interesting as well. Something else just there is, you know, Ray you said you're at the opposite end of the spectrum because your parents were lavish and it put in trouble. I only realised that after my dad died that he do he wasn't teaching me that out of here's a lesson. He was teaching me because he had like, messed up in that way and put himself in a lot of debt. <laughs> so <laughs> when I when he told me that, I thought it was one reason. It was only after he passed away that we realised that he was a, it was a it was a painful lesson that he learned in his life about money. <laughs> uh, if, if you're going to take risk and you know grow debt, you do have to pay it back at some point. <laughs> and uh, this is those interesting learnings of how how we got there. I think it's, I think going back to the ignorance is bliss and when it's comfortable, okay. I think you're like, obviously from John, you, you spoke about the financial side of things in, in that sort. I think to be quite generic, I think it's when it's okay for ignorance is bliss and to be comfortable because I think it's when you can notice the level of impact of being ignorant and ignoring it and I think when and that's about anything it could be the knock-on effect of you know I still have several trade-off conversations with myself sometimes with other head-offs in my current business where we go okay so we're frustrated about that but ultimately is it really going to impact on us that much and it's kind of like no so it's that letting go thing that's when ignorance for me is, is 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 bliss because you can just go right yeah okay, it's not going to impact on me, away it goes. And you don't worry about it then. And if it comes back and and bites people in the in the posterior, whatever it may be, future down the line, you still don't sit there and go, well, I told you so. You sit there and go, okay, well, knew that was going to be a possibility, but it's not impacted on me. So I think when you look at it in more general terms as opposed to a specific terms, I think ignorance is absolutely fine when you can look at, <laughs> hey, here's the pragmat. Uh, the pragmatism, um, but when you can start looking at things like that and, and looking at the the overall impact, so that that for me is probably when it when it kicks in more than anything, where you can recognise the the benefits or the pros or cons of being ignorant. Cool, right? We've been going for about an hour, which is uh, what we normally say we wrap up. Has, has anyone got any final thoughts you would like to to share, um, Nathan? How have you found joining us today? Yeah, it's been good. It's been, number one, it's been great to see you both again. Uh, I've always loved spending time and chatting with you guys. Um, yeah, I mean, anybody that's watching this, just just have the courage to face that fear. You know, what's the worst thing that could happen? You might make an idiot of yourself. You might do something horrendously wrong. You might, you know, screw everything up completely. But if you just sat there and never tried, if you never gave it a go, you're, you're never going to get anywhere. So, it, you know, and it obviously just... For you guys, for me personally, I got a lot of time for you both. You know that. So whatever happens with your endeavours from here on in, I just wish you all the very best wherever, whatever avenue you go down and whatever you do. Cool. Well, cheers, buddy. As always, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to catch up with you and uh, get your insights. And uh, you know, we really appreciate you taking some time to, to join us. Um, interesting what you said there. I think, you know, problems are temporary. They come and go and they don't last forever. Um, you are going to have ups and downs in your life and imagining the problems in your head are normally nine times out of 10 worse than the reality. So that's why the taking action part is so important. Go get the real life evidence. Don't get caught up in making the big monsters in your head. Cause I think that's what can really hurt and drain you and paralyze you with the overthinking. Thank you, put. I think that sums it up fantastically for me. I think the the end of the day, I think try, try, and try again. And uh, obviously, if you're comfortable, then you're happy. Then that's all that matters. Just being comfortable and happy for me is is the key to life. That's success. Is happy in your own space. But I think it's been an absolute pleasure seeing Mr. Nathan again. And I hope we can see you again soon, my friend. It's been fantastic having you on. All right. So the last the last thing to then say is, so what what we're going to talk about next week? Oof uh hopefully I'm, I'm really hopeful i'm gonna i'm putting it out there i'm putting it out there this is a big week right people this is a big week there's gonna be some big things happening by the time we meet again 
So uh, we're going to talk about uh, journeys and how coming to the end of the journey with success and how, how to get that success and how to be happy and success and celebrate that success. I don't know, something like that. All right, happiness. We're talking about happiness. Okay, oh my cool. goodness, this, it'll be a short episode, so that'll be fine then. Uh, <laughs> brilliant. Well, thanks every time, uh, both of you, and thanks to everybody who's uh, watching, listening. Uh, please do leave any comments, questions, um, anything you want, really. And if you're interested in coming on being a guest, we'll, we, we want more guests as well. Uh, other than that, we'll speak to you next week. <laughs>